Hello everyone and welcome back to Nuclear Reactor Theory Lectures. In the previous lecture, we discussed how to solve the diffusion equation for the flux in a 1D slab, and we also introduced the concept of a shape's geometric buckling. Today we're going to extend this analysis to any multidimensional spherical, cylindrical, or Cartesian system. When we apply the diffusion equation to these systems, we'll assume that the flux is separable across dimensions. We made a similar assumption in the last lecture when we assumed that the time-dependent flux could be split into a time-dependent P of T component and a spatially dependent flux shape function. Today, we'll assume that our 3D flux can be split into three independent functions in the X, Y, and Z dimensions. If we were to apply this thinking to a cylindrical geometry, such as in a fuel rod, then we could assume that our flux contains a term that is dependent on the radius and a term that depends on the height, z, in the cylinder. We could have a term that depends on the theta dimension as well, but in general we integrate this out because fuel rods tend to be symmetric over theta. Just like the last time that we assumed that the flux was separable, this assumption is not quite true. Phenomena such as self-shielding and Doppler broadening mean that the flux in one dimension can cause localized depressions or increases in the flux in another dimension, which implies some cross-dimensional link between the flux in different dimensions. However, just like before, we'll make the somewhat incorrect assumption that the flux is separable across dimensions when we solve the diffusion equation for our multidimensional systems. Now, if we're going to solve the Helmholtz form of the diffusion equation in different geometries, and we need to understand what the Laplacian operator represents in these other geometries. In cylindrical dimensions, for example, the Laplacian equals 1 over r times ddr of r times d phi dr, plus the second derivative of the flux with respect to z. We see that this expression contains one term that operates on the flux with respect to the radius, and one term with respect to z. And so, we can rephrase our Laplacian operator as the combination of this r and z Laplacian component. If we assume that our flux is separable into its r and z components, then we can convert the Helmholtz diffusion equation into this expression, after which we divide by the overall flux in r and z, and we find ourselves with this expression, which contains one term that is a function of the radial flux, and one term that is a function of the axial z-dimension flux. These two r and z components are completely independent of each other. They don't even involve the same dimensions. The only way that these two terms could add up to a constant material buckling is if they satisfy their own differential equations with two separate constants, alpha and beta, where alpha squared plus beta squared equals the material buckling. And so we're left with two independent differential equations to solve. In the last class, we solved an analogous version of this z-dimension differential equation, except for the x-dimension. And so, if we solve this equation, we find that the fundamental mode of the flux in the z-dimension is described by this cosine function, where h tilde is the extrapolated height of the cylinder. Things are a little trickier for the radial differential equation. It turns out that the solution to this differential equation is the combination of these j0 and y0 terms, where j0 and y0 are the zeroth order Bessel functions of the first and second kind, respectively. You might not have encountered these Bessel functions before, but they are famous solutions to a differential equation that arises when we try to solve the Helmholtz equation in cylindrical coordinates. A slightly more fun fact about Bessel functions is that they actually describe the modes of vibration that we see when we strike a circular drum with a drumstick. If we plot the Bessel functions, we see that the J0 Bessel function reaches a maximum value at r equals 0, and then oscillates around an asymptote at y equals 0. The Y0 Bessel function approaches negative infinity when r equals 0, which means that C0 must equal 0 if we are to have a finite positive flux for our system at r equals 0. Thus, our flux is only described by the J0 Bessel function. So what is alpha? And later on, what is A0? To solve for alpha, we're going to need to introduce a boundary condition. And once again, we use vacuum boundary conditions and require that the incoming current is 0, which means that our flux must equal 0 at some extrapolated radius, where R tilde equals R plus 2 times the diffusion coefficient. As we saw just now, 
This J0 Bessel function intersects the x-axis multiple times while it asymptotes towards zero, which means that there are multiple values of this nu that will cause our Bessel function to equal zero. So once again, our flux is represented by this infinite series of functions, which are now Bessel functions instead of cosines. Just like with our cosine series, the higher order zeros of the Bessel function represent the higher modes of the neutron flux, and the fundamental node of the flux only uses this first term, where nu zero equals about 2.4048. This implies that the alpha squared constant must equal nu zero divided by r tilde squared, and thus that our 2d rz flux is given by this combination of a cosine term and a Bessel function, where, for convenience, we will combine our constants into this c naught constant. If we substitute this expression into our Helmholtz diffusion equation from before, apply the Laplacian, and then cancel out the residual flux terms, we see that nu zero divided by r tilde squared plus pi divided by h tilde squared must equal the material buckling for a critical system. Based on this expression, we can infer that the geometric buckling for a cylindrical reactor equals nu zero divided by r tilde squared plus pi divided by h tilde squared. And so, as we said in our previous lecture, we see that our geometric buckling is once again shape dependent, and a cylinder will see a different amount of buckling compared to an infinite slab, a cube, or a sphere, whose geometric bucklings are given here. One interesting mental exercise is to ponder what the geometric buckling is for a cylinder with an infinite radius. This kind of infinitely wide cylinder is actually indistinguishable from a slab that extends to infinity in the y and z dimensions. And so it makes sense that as our radius approaches infinity for a cylinder, that our shape will have the same geometric buckling as for a 1D slab. We'll finish our lecture today by describing how to normalize the flux, which is another way of saying how to determine the constant c naught in our flux expression. So what do we know about the flux and about our reactor, and what constraints can we impose on the flux? In theory, we should know at what power our reactor is operating, which means that we should know the total rate at which fissions occur inside of our reactor. The reactor's fission rate is described by this integral of nu sigma fission times the flux over all dimensions of phase space, which in this case is just the volume integral for our monoenergetic diffusion equation scalar flux expression. Note here that we integrate from 0 to r and from h over 2 to negative h over 2 instead of all the way out to the extrapolated r and h over 2s. This is because these extrapolated boundaries exist only in our flux expression solely to help the flux assume the correct shape. We don't actually have any fuel outside of the fuel volume, so it doesn't make sense to integrate our flux over these imaginary fuel regions. So since we know what this integral should be, we can evaluate it using the flux shape functions, divide the known fission rate by these three integrals over volume, and solve for what C0 should be. And thus, we have extended our diffusion equation know-how from one dimension to a multidimensional system and we have shown how the geometric buckling depends on each of the dimensions for a given shape. In the next lecture, we'll discuss how to solve the diffusion equation in a system that's surrounded by a non-fissioning reflector region, and then also how to determine the eigenvalue for a subcritical or supercritical system.